So uh, my name is David Coyles and for the last three years I've been uh, running a research project alongside colleagues Brandon Amber and Adrian Grant from Ulster and Laura Lane and Anne Parr from London School of Economics funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and it's been looking at uh, what we've been calling hidden barriers and divisive architecture and Whenever we talk about the vice of architecture in Northern Ireland, everybody immediately thinks about peace walls. Our project's been looking at something actually very distinct and quite different from peace walls. Uh, it's a range of hidden barriers that were put in place uh, as a result of a security planning process that accompanied the redevelopment of social housing that took place in Belfast largely between 1976 and 1985. And what's quite distinctive about these barriers is that they're not visible like peace walls. Uh, they don't stand out. They're really made up of ordinary, everyday bits of the built environment. Things like shops, offices, bits of landscaping, roads and footpaths. But they've become so well entrenched really in the everyday fabric of Belfast today that they almost hide in plain sight. So they represent an important legacy of the Troubles. Now, I should say at this point, it, it's important that uh, I make the point that it's difficult to, to talk about this stuff without using the words Catholic and Protestant, mentioning security forces and emotive terms like that. Uh, we're not really interested in passing judgment on the validity of decisions that were taken back in a time of conflict. What we're really interested in is what does it mean now in what we might call a post-Troubles era for particular communities in Belfast to be living within a built environment that was designed to deal with what you might call Troubles era security concerns. Now, it's going to be difficult to see this map in that with the lights on, unfortunately. If you could turn them off, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Because if we go back to the city layout before the redevelopment took place, inner city Belfast largely characterised by a really dense network of interconnected Victorian terrace streets, which I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with. By 1976, uh, this housing was in really, really bad condition. Uh, government files from that time that we discovered talked about how they considered it to be the worst housing stock in Western Europe. That's after decades and decades of this industrial era housing undergoing uh, economic decline. So the response by government was, let's have an intensive program of redevelopment right across the city. So we'll go through areas on a piecemeal basis and renew the housing there. But of course, in tandem with this, from the onset of the Troubles in 1969 and well before that, you also had long established an often violent sectarian confrontation going on in these areas. And whilst with hindsight you might be thinking that at that time housing policy and security policy would have worked hand in hand to try and resolve those issues. You can kind of see it now, yeah. That actually wasn't the case. Housing policy and security policy were very, very separate. And certainly in the public eye, there was a real attempt made by the Northern Ireland office at that time to keep the public debate quite separate. And if I could just read a couple of quotes that we found. So this is from a private memo from the Northern Ireland office, which said that we believe for security and policing reasons the balance of advantage lies against provoking widespread discussion on sectarianism and housing, and that any such discussion would be unlikely to be actively supported by the police and the army. We seem to find it easier to control violence in areas where community boundaries are clearly defined. And so the ultimate conclusion of these internal deliberations were 
to quote, get on with the rebuilding of dilapidated areas while trying to weaken sectarian confrontation by stealth. So out of that deliberation, uh, a committee was established behind the scenes called the, the Standing Committee on the Security Implications of Housing. And the idea was that this committee would work in tandem with the redevelopment process, but out of public view, and have a look at the proposals for contentious areas of the city and see if what the housing executive were proposing might be tweaked or amended or revised to try and facilitate long-term security planning. And the consequence of that is that, I mean, this is the map of present-day Belfast, and through our substantial archival research and contemporary interviews, focus groups and community engagement workshops, we've established six distinctive areas within the city where that secret process and the public process of redevelopment worked hand in hand to embed a diverse range of hidden barriers um, within the city that remain there today. And although current policy tends to focus on you know, the most visible manifestations of the vision, which are the peace walls, we think that there really is a good policy base there already that could be developed to address uh, the hidden barriers that we're going to talk about. And if I could just maybe ask Brandon for a minute to elaborate on that policy base. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brandon Hamber. I'm from uh, Ulster University. Um, before we talk specifically about the hidden barriers and, and hidden boundaries, uh, it's important for us, uh, as you can see from, from the map there, to really point out what are some of the existing policies that are dealing with the legacy that David has outlined. Uh, and when you start to look at the existing policies, there's an enormous number of, uh, of these policies. Um, and what we would really argue is that most of these policies really look at Belfast from above. Um, so hence that photograph. It sort of looks at Belfast from a macro perspective, which from a policy perspective is perhaps a good place to start. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the policies, but maybe just point to a few. So um, the TBAC policy, Together Building a United Community, talks about segregation in housing and our education system, physical divisions, and invisible lines of separation that exist in both urban and rural settings. It doesn't really elaborate on what it means by these invisible barriers, and part of what we're going to do shortly is uh, articulate some of that for you. Or if you look at the Building Safer and Shared and Confident Communities, uh, or the Community Safety Strategy, uh, it talks about we need to create spaces that are for the community as a whole, and which the community feels safe using and passing through. So it's quite a macro idea of what the space is rather than the micro residential space in which people live. Or the Regeneration Community Development Policy Framework, which aims to improve linkage, linkages between areas of need and areas of opportunity. So clearly thinking of the larger map, how would you link uh, certain parts of the city, areas of opportunity uh, with areas of need. And there are many other policies. Uh, they're in the document we've supplied to you, and maybe in the interest of time I won't go, uh, I won't go through, through all of them. Um, but if you look at the strategic uh, planning and policy statement for Northern Ireland, it notes the planning of the system can assist in the removal of barriers to shared space. Um, so this idea of shared space comes up a lot. So again, thinking of spaces which are between communities and at much more of a macro level than what we're going uh, to, talk to, you, um, to talk to you about uh, specifically. Um, if we look at the Department of Environment, Living Places and Urban Stewardship and Design Guide for Northern Ireland 2014, it ag acknowledges the implications that specific residential design typologies can have on movement and connectivity. And it specifically, for example, talks about the cul-de-sac design, which is something uh, we're going uh, to talk to you about. So why am I telling you all of this? What well, I'm telling you in terms of what I mentioned earlier, firstly, that a lot of these policies are quite at a macro level rather than where we have, uh, have been uh, uh, focusing. They also tend to be fairly broad, catch-all uh, type of uh, policy statements. Now, we are aware, of course, there are different developments uh, that are going on, say, in terms of urban villages and other types of areas and, and initiatives around the peace walls, but at a policy level uh, are, fairly, uh, are fairly broad. <clears throat> 
But importantly for us, what this also means as we take you into the next section of the paper, that this also, despite some of these statements being large, this also presents an opportunity to address the issues that we want to talk about. Because they are written in, in different ways, in a range of policy documents, but not in a very, uh, in a, not in a very specific way. So what David's now going to do is talk to you a little bit about the city from below and look at the hidden barriers and boundaries uh, that we've been looking at. So our findings suggest three types of a hidden barrier that, that, that we find. Um, at the first level, there are what we're calling inter-community hidden barriers. These are quite easy to understand. They're, they are examples where large-scale uses of architecture have been put in place to simply separate two communities that were once connected. Then at the second level, you have intra-community barriers, and they're examples where within a particular community, single identity community, the spaces within it have been broken up and disconnected to create a residential environment that's really fragmented, difficult to find your way around, where mobility, where literal mobility and circulation are greatly restricted. And then a third type that we've, that we've evidenced through the research are what we're calling hidden barriers. And these are examples in the periphery of these communities where seemingly benign bits of architecture, bits of public space, actually represent at a local level the recognized territorial boundary between two perceived territories. <coughs> and the best way to really show you what we're talking about is to, to use examples. So the first example I can talk about from an inter-community barrier point of view this is the Old Park Cliftonville area of North Belfast, and let's see, yeah, that roughly outlines 17 acres of housing that used to exist in the Lower Old Park area, where there is an industrial estate today. Now, in 1976, our papers show that there was a great concern uh, from a security point of view that that housing in what was perceived as a Protestant area, it was largely vacant, uh, might be overrun by lots of displaced Catholics moving into the Cliftonville area. Now, that had two implications that were a perceived threat. One of those was that the existing Protestant community there would be squeezed down and reduced and possibly eliminated. And also that Cliftonville would join with Ardoin to create this huge, <coughs> and I use the words from the documents again, a huge Catholic wedge that would then present a real problematic uh, issue for the security forces. So by placing the industrial estate on that housing and taking that housing literally out of the supply chain, so the industrial estate that's there today, you can just about see in the distance the Cliftonville houses the Ardoin houses and a little piece of Lower Old Park that has been retained. So that industrial estate and those factories form a permanent barrier uh, between those areas. Another example in the, in the north of the city, uh, in 1976 we had a site here for Catholic housing for residents who had been displaced from other parts of the city. And to use the terminology again from the, the papers, there was a, a concern about it being situated beside a owner-occupied middle-class Protestant area. And the fear was that if you build the, the housing executive houses here, that the people in the settled area will flee in fear. Um, that will allow squatters to move in and again create a huge... Catholic wedge right beside what was called the hardline Ballycillan estate, creating an interface area on the Crumlin Road. So in this instance, uh, the actual minister for housing himself inserted conditions into the planning permission that a 12 meter deep heavy planted zone be put in place to do two things, to prevent any physical connection whatsoever between the two settlements and also so that none of the 
housing executive houses could look onto the owner occupied houses. And then in the final example I'll show of that kind of barrier, uh, this is the Twinbrook area in the southeast of the city. Beside the Arima estate, in the 1976, there was a shared green space and a shared link road that went here between these two estates. This shared green space served as a kind of ad hoc battleground whenever tensions were running high. And that gave the security forces a degree of concern, but also, as, as has been established before, there were a lot of squatters had moved into the Twinbrook estate. It was becoming quite hardline Republican at the time, and there was fear that squatters here would move across and intimidate people in the Arima estate out of their houses, and thus turning it from a mixed estate into a hardline Republican estate. And today there's a four-lane dual carriageway that provides a permanent barrier between those two communities. What we're calling intra-community barrier is something quite different. Um, and during the 1970s, as a lot of you will know, it was quite popular in design terms across the bulk of Western Europe and in, and in America that people were trying to move away from older ways of thinking about how people lived in cities and trying to create streets that would maybe be a barrier to through traffic, creating safe residential areas and creating spaces where people felt they had a sense of ownership over them. Now, within Belfast, those trends were also adopted, but whenever you try and mitigate or limit the amount of movement by vehicle or by pedestrian, there are also obvious security benefits to that. And in the map that I kind of tried to show at the start, if you think about the dense interconnected Victorian street network, uh, our files show how the army and the police would talk about the multitude of escape routes that there were for people pursuing, people trying to evade the security forces. So right across Belfast, we've, we've evidenced um, Lots and lots of examples where former, formerly interconnected areas have been deliberately uh, disconnected. And this isn't, I mean, in this example, it's quite blatant. This was an old through street that would have connected uh, the Albert Bridge Road in East Belfast with the Beers Bridge Road. So by putting what was called a community garden in the middle of it, you then create two cul-de-sacs disconnected from each other. This was another through street that ran. I mean, it looks like the access to the car park, but it's not. It's actually what's left of a street that once went from the Newton Road the whole way over to the Albert Bridge Road over here. And there was literally a new housing development placed on top of it. So those two streets were completely disconnected. And the back of that housing is quite literally turned to the frontage of the Newton Road. And in this example, uh, this was another through road called Templemore Street and a house was quite literally placed in the middle of it to create uh, two completely disconnected courtyard developments. And so in interviewing the, the different designers and planners that worked on these, on the redevelopment and on these designs, we found a really, really complex mix of motives behind it. The DOE themselves talked about how isolated residential developments would represent a safer and better basis for the future. That was one thing. But when it played out to individual designers on the ground, you know, I'll just really relate some of the quotes. Uh, they talked about how, for example, if you had an area where you could escape in this direction, this direction, and this direction, there was usually a lot of terrorist incidents. So that was partly why the Northern Ireland office tried to tighten up on that. So you get rid of the alleyways. And another one, uh, we tried to create areas, sort of keep areas more as residential areas so that you only went there if you actually lived there. Or houses that were deliberately difficult to find 
so that you would need to know the house is there and that was the plan that only residents would know the route to the house. Or the idea that the design thinking about redeveloping these areas was how do you go back to something that gives the local people control of the area but keeps those that aren't from the area out. So these are all fairly definitive barriers to what, as an architect or a designer, you would try and implement <coughs> in your proposals to promote you know, shared space and a feeling of mobility. So the third type of barrier that we'd like to talk about would be um, hidden boundaries, and Adrian's done some interesting work on that, and I'll maybe let him talk to you about the examples that we have. Okay, I'm Adrian Grant from Ulster University as well, um, and my main role in the project has been uh, involved in interviewing residents of the case study areas and in talking to community workers and others with uh, some connection to the areas. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples um, from the areas that David's already discussed uh, that look at more kind of psychological barriers, hidden barriers within those communities that have been redesigned during that period in the 70s and 80s. So this first example is on the Ligonil Road. This is the example where David talked about further up on the hill where the uh, housing executive houses were built and the, um, the dense vegetation planted between that and the owner-occupied houses. Now this is further down towards the, Ligon or the Bally Sillon side. And what we have here is a traffic junction to the, the, the naked eye almost. Um, but in speaking to people who live in Ligonil, this is seen as an interface area so people generally recognise these traffic lights as the end of Catholic Ligonil and the beginning of Protestant Ballysillen. Um, so the type of examples that, that people have given here are that younger people, younger males in the area, um, feel very uncomfortable walking further beyond these traffic lights for fear of attack or intimidation. Uh, if you can move on to the next one. This is the entrance to Glenbag Park, which is um, just a few yards down from the traffic lights on Ligonil Road. Um, and Glenbag Park is largely seen as <coughs> Ballysillen territory, um, and the people of Ligonil generally don't feel ownership of that park. These gates were welded shut for many years uh, and have just been opened quite recently. Um, yet in talking to people um, who live in Ligonil, the general feeling is that um, they do not feel welcome there. Um, and we have had a few people give us examples of um, verbal attacks that have been made on them um, while taking a shortcut through the park down to the, Cr the Crumlin Road. Um, the next one there, David, please. This is Old Park Road. Um, and the first example that David gave, gave was the development of the industrial estate um, between Lower Old Park and Cliftonville and Ardoin. Um, this was an existing road um, and to the right is basically the Lower Old Park area uh, and to the left is the industrial estate. Um, the shops that you can see directly in front are in Cliftonville. Um, people living in the Lower Old Park area have generally told us that they will not use the shops and services up there. This isn't, a, isn't everyone, it's sort of a, just a general viewpoint that seems to have come through from the interviews. Um, and it, it reinforces the, 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 the view that the Lower Old Park is almost like a satellite of the Shankill area rather than integrated with its surroundings in the Crumlin Road, Cliftonville uh, area. And one final example is um, a little bit outside the city then. So this is Black's Road, um, which runs through the Suffolk Estate and again is seen as a, a hidden barrier. So many people in the Suffolk Estate feel almost hemmed in. The, area, the estate is surrounded by steel fencing on all sides. Um, there's a very recognised interface on the Stewardstown Road between Lenadun and Suffolk. But again, the estate is... is um, is, is seen as being sort of surrounded by Catholic housing on all four sides. This uh, filling station in, dis in the distance, people generally will use it in daytime, daylight hours, but uh, after nightfall, there's a feeling of fear, um, a fear of intimidation, and there have been uh, antisocial attacks, vandalism attacks on this road that are interpreted as being sectarian. So just a few sort of very specific examples to give you an idea of what we're talking about. <coughs> 
Okay, so uh, in conclusion, what does that uh, all mean? Um, the first thing is, I mean, we have been working on this now for three years, documenting these different types of hidden barriers, and as David said, engaging with communities and also undertaking a range of, of interviews. And I think the more we've done the work, the more we've become convinced that the city is embedded within the normal infrastructure with an enormous number of hidden boundaries and hidden barriers, uh, as, as we've articulated. Um, and we all know very well in this room that there are strong and significant developments at a policy level around the, the removal of peace walls, around wider levels of connectivity uh, and infrastructure development uh, within the city. Um, but what this project has helped us realize is that actually we need to perhaps look at uh, these types of barriers and, and boundaries in a much more micro way and start to develop policy around that. So two general uh, recommendations that are coming out the work for us at this point in time. The first is, uh, and perhaps it goes without saying for many of you in the room, but engaging local communities to actually identify these hidden barriers and develop locally led initiatives to promote their removal and transformation is really important. Uh, certainly I can say for myself some of the most instructive parts of this project have been walking around the communities with local community representatives and they point out a gate here, a small road here, there's a mixture of issues that are going on which might be about historical sectarian issues but also current antisocial issues and underdevelopment issues but the, the, li the lines and the boundaries are integrally linked uh, within that. Um, so communities themselves would have to be key to how uh, we would take uh, such such a process forward. That's recognized, for example, in the T-Buck strategy. It does talk about community engagement. But if we were to start to address these issues, we would need to uh, make sure that uh, community consultation and engagement is at the heart of um, at the heart of these uh, this process. The second recommendation, which is perhaps uh, more substantial, um, maybe you know as challenging in in many ways, would be to establish what we would call a ten-year connectivity program for the removal transformation of at least 10 hidden barriers and re-establish physical connections between community spaces that have currently uh, been uh, separate. And I, where that's coming from is that we noted that the program which actually led to a lot of these hidden barriers was a sort of 10-year development process. So should we very deliberately and very consciously be saying, this is our strategy over 10 years on how we aim to break uh, these type of barriers down. And when we talk about connectivity here, we're not necessarily talking about the macro connectivity of a big new road, but it might be a bridge in a certain area or redesigning a park or widening a street uh, or something to that effect, um, but you would need to basically create a catalogue of the different types of hidden barriers and then start to develop these quite specific localised uh, strategies. Of course we have current programmes to learn from in relation to that, for example the Cumber Greenway and other types of uh, work that is going on, but we would advocate that a much closer cataloguing and connectivity process needs to, to take place, underpinned by looking at different uh, best practices, and also of course connecting these to current initiatives. Um, so if you were looking at a Peace Walls strategy, how would you be looking at the more micro developments around that and the, the barriers that we've identified around that process to make those work in tandem with each other. Because what our research would suggest is even if in some areas you took down a peace wall, there's a whole range of other barriers and boundaries that exist in and around those spaces that need to be part uh, of, that, uh, of that wider process. So thank you very much.